It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our goal. Hey! hey. It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey, hey everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. I am Tom Papa, and I've got a good one for you today. Our guest today is the very talented connoisseur of comedy, great filmmaker, great stand-up comedian, all-around good guy, Judd Apatow. Yes, he has a new documentary coming out on HBO Max all about George Carlin called American Dream. And uh, I watched it, and for someone who knows everything about Carlin, it was a bunch of new stuff. <laughs> it was really, really well done. Uh, very excited to sit down and uh, talk with Judd today. You are going to love it. I also baked him a kick-ass bread. And he got a little bit of my Chiambella, my beautiful Italian grandma lemon cake. Oh, boy. He should, he should just he should put me in all movies from here on out, just for the Chiambella. I'd like to thank the good people at Helix Sleep for sponsoring today's show. We love Helix Sleep. They have made me a better sleeper with their beautiful mattress. I took their two-minute sleep quiz, which you can do, and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. I know some of you are sleeping on some saggy old mattresses at night. You deserve better than that, so give yourself an upgrade and find your perfect mattress at Helix Sleep dot com slash papa also like to thank the good people at every plate every plate these people give you these amazing meals for just a dollar 79 per meal show up at your place go to easyplate.com enter the code papa 179 that's papa 179 because it's a dollar 79 per meal that's everyplate.com enter the code papa 179 for just dollar 79 per meal that's up to a 104 dollar value Good meals, healthy stuff. You're going to love having these people as a part of your life. And we love having them as part of the podcast. So Judd Apatow. Uh, the great thing about Judd is he loves comedy. He, I mean, he's created all these amazing shows. He's worked, I mean, you go through all the, the meaningful comedies in film and television and girls and Talladega Nights and I mean he's just the, the, the list is so long and the great thing about him is that you he is a stand up at heart and he just he has just dedicated his life to this stuff and just finds such joy in being around it and has done this great job of actually making things that if you're a comedy fan and new generations of comedy fans uh you're just, we're just lucky to, to have him. He created this, did this great documentary with, I'm going to call him one of the loves of his life, Gary Shandling. And now he's doing this one or did this one with George Carlin. I mean, these are two giants and to really dive in and tell the story. It's a big responsibility, you know, to actually create pieces of art off of artists work you don't want to diminish it you don't want to make it smaller you want to and you you know that all these great people who are inspired by these types of people uh are going to digest it so there's only one person that could make this stuff and that is judd he for all the great stuff that he's done though he's such a great just great guy as you'll see in this conversation i mean he's just raised a great family he just loves hanging with other comics we did um a couple shows at largo together where he was kind of finding his way back after the pandemic and was wondering what he's going to talk about on stage and didn't want to just go up there and just start babbling or he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do so the two of us would just go up and be involved in this conversation uh for <laughs> for about I don't know 20 to 30 minutes and he's so easy to talk to 
and he's so funny. There's there's definitely there's the combination of the everyman just kind of like cool guy, but there's also a lot more at work. He's always thinking of lines, as you'll see in this conversation. He doesn't let things go by without knowing that it's his responsibility to continue to be funny. And uh, I just can't, I, it's just one of those guys that you're just lucky to uh, have in your life if you are in comedy. And I'm glad that he came to the table and I was able to give him this great bread and this great Chiambella and introduce him to all of you in hopefully a different way. Hopefully like the Carlin documentary, uh, introducing Carlin and showing you things that maybe you didn't know. Maybe this podcast will show you some things you don't know about Judd. So let's get to it. Enjoy the conversation with Judd Apatow. Beautiful. Well, thank you for being here. I, uh, I was, uh, I know you came a long way, and I, I was only kind of kidding that you should probably get a hotel. Yeah. Well, you sometimes people give you the Zoom option these days. <laughs> yeah, They're yeah. like, you know, or we could do it Zoom, and they give you that look like, but it will suck on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and it's funny now because we're so used to like avoiding driving and going places. <laughs> I know. And so we all did so many podcasts on, at home. Yeah. And they were fine. And now, yeah. you know, like I'm going to do Whitney Cummings podcast, and like, yeah, it's in Woodland Hills, <laughs> and you're like. So do you think I have to go to Woodland Hills to do this? Because that's not like a podcast. That's half my day. Yeah, that's the whole day. I got shit to do. I, I and then know. I thought about it for a long time. Like, how much do I like Whitney? <laughs> do I owe Whitney anything? <laughs> what did she do for me? I decided I liked her. I decided I liked her. I'm going to get in the She's car in the and club. do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed a thing from doing our radio show, all Zoom, like 90% since it's the troubles. And when I run into people in real life, they forget that they even did the thing like because we don't really connect that way yeah. it's just another screen as much yeah. as like you can get a good conversation going it's not it doesn't have yeah. that depth it's weird uh, we're not really friends from our from our podcasts yeah <laughs> right exactly <laughs> you get really intimate for an hour and you see him like a year later and yeah. like, hey man what's up <laughs> right. Wait, you told me things i know remember you telling me about your mom <laughs> i had that with my book you know uh, not to plug sicker in the head yes but you know you get you know you get your hour with lin-manuel miranda and you're yeah. like this is a beautiful thing that uh, will last our entire lives and then <laughs> You know, when you meet up again, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it landed as much for them as yeah, for you. <laughs> I know. Because they do 200 I, of them. I know. <laughs> the book is so good. Here's the best part about the book is uh, this is a fake book. It's not, it's not even the book. It's just, oh, it's not? It's just the cover it's, on a different book. What? what book is it a cover on is a good question. <laughs> what do you mean? Because they just sent it to me to show me what the cover looked like. Oh, that's oh, hilarious. Oh, my God. It's the Ben Rhodes book, After the Fall, which is about <laughs> hungry, uh, which is, by the way, I think a great book. But oh, that's it is, hilarious. Uh, it's, it's not, not this even book. the book. That's so it's funny. It's not even the book. Oh, that's hilarious. I've been on, when I was on the road, uh, signing books after my mm -hmm. shows, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the galley copies got through, like we're in the pile, yeah, yeah, yeah. and people came back up to the line <laughs> like, um, there's something wrong with this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like blank pages and X marks. <laughs> Uh, well, first, before we get into all the projects, um, this is the bread I baked you. That's more important than yeah, the project. It's a, it's called a country brown nice. and it's a whole wheat. It looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. It'll probably need some toasting. This, this bread lasts for like three, four days. And this, I made it yesterday. Uh, it's a, it's gorgeous. And when you make the bread yes. for the show. Yeah. Are you excited to make the bread for the show or, or like, yes. is that a time for yourself or do you go like, Oh, I gotta make another bread because we're doing the damn show. <laughs> no, because I'm always baking bread. Yeah. I'm always messing around. Yeah. So then when I know like, oh, this is Judd's bread. Yeah. It, it, it steps you up. Oh, it's that's like, fantastic. Yeah. You're like, okay, this has got to be good. Please don't be messed yeah. up. Don't be yeah. flat. Don't do things. <laughs> and then the big conflict this morning, because yeah. uh, I thought we were doing it yesterday and it yeah. ended up being today. Uh, and yesterday I made one with walnuts in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's. I don't know. Yeah. Is Judd a walnut guy? Is he a nut in the bread guy? You know what? I don't think we know yet. <laughs> that might have <laughs> determined it for the future. Because so, I've never sought it out, but I have never rejected it. Right. <laughs> so I had, um, I make two at a time. So I had two walnuts and, and two yeah. of the other ones. And this morning for breakfast, I taste tested both of them yeah. from my loaves. And... They're both really good, but this one's better. This one's better. Yeah. I, and is baking baking bread uh, like a meditative thing? A hundred percent. See, I this is what I'm realizing lately. 
my wife gave me an article about hoarding uh-huh. and it was about, oh, no. about how like hoarders have <laughs> ADD mm-hmm. because they look at all their shit and they're like, I don't know where to put all this because they're having an ADD meltdown. Right, right. And, I, and she's like, I think maybe this is why you're such a hoarder because I, I don't like throwing anything out. And I hoard everything. Like, like I'll sit on the phone and look at articles on Apple News and just save them furiously. <laughs> I, I've never like looked at the section that has the saved ones. You never go back. I just, for some reason, <laughs> just accumulate. Just it. to know they're there. Like one day, maybe I'll yeah. get to it. Like a person who won't throw out like an eighty-year-old birdcage. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm realizing that I have a, that I'm much more attention deficit than I thought, uh-huh. which is why I don't do things like baking bread. Right. So I need, it I needs need focus. Thing. It does I, need focus. I used to play a little guitar terribly, but I take out the old James Taylor yeah. songbook and <laughs> like try to play stuff for an hour or two. Yeah. And I realized like, I don't think I've done that like consistently for 20 years because so, of the ADD, I think. Do you think the ADD has increased? I think it's increased from like the phone and the social media uh, and just working and right. my, so I feel like I'm ping ponging in my brain yeah. way more and I need a really boring meditative thing. Well, it's really interesting because the bread baking, I equate the bread baking with peace in my life now because that means it's a three day process. So wow. that means that I know I'm not on the road mm-hmm. for like I, I have those days Yeah, and and everything's kind of, and I'm not, when I'm in town, I'm not like banging around doing a whole bunch of stuff. Cause you know, it starts in the morning and then you've got to shape it and do stuff by the night. And yeah. There's all these kind of things. So I'll be like thinking, well, if I, if I have a nine o'clock at the store, I've got to shape it <laughs> before eight so I can get it in the It's fridge. like having a puppy. <laughs> I got to be home to walk the dog. <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it, it actually kind of, kind of, uh, is like, it's like a goal of, calmness now the zen of baking bread yeah See, i need a thing like that but you've got bread so i need it to be like lasagna yeah. or something <laughs> that would be like funny. an 80 level lasagna <laughs> J- judd is really he just travels with lasagna <laughs> all right and now this i brought you because mm-hmm. it's morning yes and if it were the coffee and i made this this is a a, a chia bella <gasps> you which made is a, that i made this oh. which is a lemon cake on mother's day i realized i didn't have any sweets for cynthia you could make lemon cakes at your house i didn't even think that was possible yeah I know. that's a bakeable I, in-house it, thing it makes me so proud and it has like it's in like the bunt cake thing so it looks kind of yeah. like lumpy yeah it's a beautiful thing but my um, let me say something that's my favorite thing in the world it is you ever go into starbucks and they have like the crap version of that yes and it has a too little much white frosting. frosting well not too much easy <laughs> yeah. but uh, there's a frosting at the top sometimes i'll buy it and just eat the frosting part <laughs> just the lick top. it like an oreo and then you look at it, it's like i'm i don't want to get sued by the starbucks people but i'm pretty sure it's like 800 calories I know. Like, like it's your whole day of food is this one thing but the fact that you can make like the great version at home this is the great version because uh the frosting for me is too much. It's like yeah. too much of a sugar dump. Yeah. And there is definitely sugar in this, but this is, uh, this is a little bit more of a, this is a, 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 a cake your grandmother would give you yeah. without feeling too guilty that she's going to like, she's not going to wreck your day and bring she, you yeah. back to your mom. That she way. might give you the Entebbe's version. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can have that at any point right. that you want. Uh, but you said you're fasting. Well, I went a little crazy on Mother's Day <laughs> and ate, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll take an occasion that's meant to celebrate someone else <laughs> yeah. and I will use it to indulge like an addiction to yeah. food and pizza and cake. Like, well, we can have gelato. It's your special day <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because my wife will indicate to me, yeah. stop eating and, you know, hurrying your drive to the grave. <laughs> uh, she wants me to yeah. live. Does and she monitor you? She, well, it's not like she's monitoring. It's, you know, it's, it's looks, but then you know, we can tell when I'm out of control. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it used to be I would fight, fight it like, hey, don't, you don't worry what I eat. Uh-huh. And then at some point, like, she's so correct. <laughs> you're just living in shame all the time. <laughs> and so during the pandemic, we stopped eating red meat. Uh-huh. And then I lost like 16 pounds or something Whoa. like that. Just from that? Well, from that and just trying to not be an animal. Uh-huh. And then started exercising, walking mainly. Hours right. and hours a day. Right. Like a crazy person. Like two hour walks every That's what morning. Sedaris did. Yes, yeah. But he picks up garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Sedaris picks up garbage, which I'm not doing anything to help anybody. 
<laughs> and but he does that as a probably like a meditation too. He said that yeah. it's, he writes and he cleans up his neighborhood. I yeah. think the queen gave him a medal for this. Oh, really? I may be wrong. I don't know if the queen herself, but I know that the Jeez. prizes got involved. Wow. And uh, then slowly gained it all back <laughs> uh-huh. and lost it again. Really? And now I'm about halfway up. And then I started getting a little crazy with the food because I had COVID. Uh-huh. And I always remembered like... When you, when you have COVID or you have any disease, don't have sugar. Right. It's really bad for your system. It's stressing right. your system out. But then like three days into COVID, I'm like, I think my COVID wants a pint of haagen <laughs> <laughs> And I went a little off the rails eating badly right. at the end of COVID. God. I still got better. It's amazing these extremes, isn't yeah. it? Like I, I'm the same way. Like I'll go all in and just <laughs> devour every, like I can't stop. Like. Yeah. handfuls of cheese it's as i'm cooking yeah. and it's just like i can't stop and yeah. then the only way to do it is to say i'm eating nothing i need that now so it's a it's a it's a preset there's this like food assisted fast it's called prolon they uh-huh. give you a little box and it has like a little plastic bag with like four olives in it that that's like <laughs> your snack and a little bar for breakfast and then like a soup but it's really like a little bag of some sort of powder and you put it in water and boil it. <laughs> oh God. The, the, the thing that I like about it. Yeah. It, I don't get that hungry. Uh-huh. I can handle the, the, just eating the weird teeny amount. Yeah. But I love that I'm making a choice that I'm not allowed to choose what to eat. Right. Because I'm a, again, the hoarding, I'm a little out of control. Yeah. So if you put a pizza on the table in my head, it has to be completed. Uh-huh. Like if you have like two, I might have six. <laughs> yeah. If you have four, I'll have two. If you have zero, I'm going to have six. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like I have a weird, I do too. A weird thing. I, you know how they say like get a small plate. And if you make all your food on smaller plates, yeah. psychologically, you just want to finish and you're done, yeah. but I got a big plate house, <laughs> right? And I, I'd like them to be done. <laughs> we have big plates. It's all big plates. Yeah. <laughs> I always, I was saying to somebody the other night that I don't have. Oh, she was. I was with Kira Soltanovich. We were doing a show, and we went to eat after. And uh, I was like, "Oh, do you want this? You want some more of this?" And she was like, "No, I can't. I just." And I was like, "I don't have that." <laughs> Like I don't, like I don't have, like if I will just yeah. keep eating, yeah. and, and it's only the socially unacceptable yeah. part of it that I, people are going to start looking at you like you're a weirdo <laughs> or disgusting. That's the only reason that I'll stop. See where my head went, as you said, like the only socially unacceptable part to me, the socially <laughs> unacceptable part is slowing down. <laughs> like, and you know what it is? I, I try to like trace it back, like yeah. food issues. Right. One is my mom loved to just stuff me. Uh-huh. It was like a love thing. My mom was yeah. very needy. Uh-huh. So if I indicated I was happier eating like a half an Entenmann's cake, she would give it to me. <laughs> right. Like if I'm like, make me grilled cheese, make me three hamburgers. She would just, she was all about giving yeah, the food. Well, so that was like though. love. Yeah. Then my parents got divorced and I learned how to cook shitty things like uh-huh. grilled cheese and hamburgers. We had a little grill in the center <laughs> island in my house. Uh-huh. And at like 11, I was so proud that I could make a hamburger. <laughs> and so I would make yeah. hamburgers every day. Yeah. I would make four patties <laughs> two double hamburgers almost every day and grilled cheese and Entenmann's cake while uh, I watched Merv Griffin yeah <laughs> and then when my friends and I got jobs as dishwashers we had money uh-huh. and we were like let's go to Beefsteak Charlie's they have an all you can eat ribs and as like 15 16 year olds we thought it was so adult and manly yeah. to go to like an all you can eat restaurant or Red Lobster <laughs> and it's some of my favorite memories is gorging myself on food so yeah. now if you were like hundred percent you look great i think you could eat a pizza right now <laughs> the level of joy i get from eating the pizza yeah it's so much bigger than the shame afterwards oh, that's 100%. the problem i don't have enough shame no a hundred percent my my wife has d- didn't grow up that way i grew up very similar to the way you do where yeah. my mom was making all this stuff and my father was i always remember it's going to White Castle, <laughs> and him introducing me to White Castle, and yeah. the whole object was was to eat as many as you could. Yeah. And we would sit in this car and stack them all on the dashboard <laughs> and just plow. And yeah. it was just so we were so 
you know, we were bonding and just having, a, I mean, I'm with my dad and yeah. he's showing me this thing and any all you can eat thing. The beefsteak Charlie really makes me laugh because I, I don't know, was that an East Coast Well, we couldn't thing? believe, I mean, it was funny because we really thought we were geniuses taking advantage of the system right. by like not eating for the whole day and going to Beefsteak Charlie. We're like, going to show them. We're going to show them. And as a 15, 6 year it's like the most hilarious thing would be to see how much you can max out an all you can eat thing. Yeah. And White Castle, I forgot which comedian it was. I don't know if it was Bobby Collins. Collins yeah. is the person I think of, but it, it yeah. might not have been who, who used to say, yeah, White Castle, it turns into a fart in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> On Long Island, it was all White Castle jokes. Right. So many White Castle jokes. So many. Beefsteak Charlie was, the logo was a big man with a handlebar mustache, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had shrimp, all you could eat shrimp. I remember when we realized that you could make shrimp yourself. Yeah. This blew our mind. You could go to a supermarket and buy shrimp and boil it. <laughs> and, and we would buy like cocktail sauce and act like we were 50 years old when we were children. And so we are smoking cigars. Yeah. The food is the best. That's the worst part about it. Well, yeah, especially if you don't, you know, if you're not addicted to drugs yeah. or you're not addicted to women or alcohol, it's like, what else are yeah. we supposed to do? Like, yeah. give us something. There's no bad meal. This is the thing where I, I have the opposite of my wife where like, if we go to a restaurant and it's terrible, yeah. she's kind of bummed out. Right. She's like, that was a wasted meal. Uh -huh. In the worst restaurant, I'm so happy. So if I hated the meal, like that was still kind of fun. <laughs> I know. Yeah, my wife will say, oh, the food wasn't very good. It's like, that's not the point. Yeah. We were sitting together. We were gorging ourselves. <laughs> I ate something. Like, I really am more about like the feeling, the post- like pass out exhaustion yeah. from eating too much. <laughs> like it almost doesn't matter how I got there. Yeah. <laughs> so what's a what's a a normal breakfast for you? Like when you're not fasting, you're just feeling okay. I uh, you know you for a while I was buying these <laughs> this cereal. It's <laughs> like it's like uh, you know what do they call it? Like a cacao, <laughs> you know, grains, uh -huh. you know, some form of a granola, right. but really it's just all hidden sugar, but still, it, yeah. but it presents itself uh -huh. as a health food. Yeah. And it doesn't quite taste like chocolate, but it's in the universe of something <laughs> like chocolate, you know, some sort of nibs or something. Cacao. And then I, I would eat it and it'd be like, I'm eating healthy. This must be good for me. Yeah. And then one day I like, I checked the label and I'm, I'm having like a thousand calorie breakfast with this little cereal right so I, I i've slowed that down but yeah you know oh, a friend of mine had a friend that created this bagel store in connecticut called like pop-up bagels or something mm -hmm. i think that is the name it was an article about it in the new york times yesterday oh and, really? and I, my friend wow. introduces me to him and he's like this guy makes the best bagels in the world he's like decided to make the best bagels wow and they were the best bagels. And he was like having a thing where he was like cooking for people, showing them what it was yeah. at my friend's house. And I sat there and ate three bagels just with butter. Yeah. And that's what I like. Bagels oh, with like God. a pound of butter on the it. The butter's so good. <laughs> There's this French butter and I literally, this is, I, this is me being a bad host. Mm. I wanted to get you this wheel of butter, this French, <laughs> because it's kind of even off Sherman way. Yeah. It's like this one place where you can get it. There's mm -hmm. two places in LA yeah. where you can find it. It's so good. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll still get it for you, but you put that butter on it. Oh my God. God. And then you have to have three. That's how with bagels, when you go to three. <laughs> three is really big time. <laughs> it's like during the, during, uh, the pandemic, there was a day where <laughs> I had two pints of ice cream. I had never gone to the second pint. Uh -huh. I never even thought that that was a option. Yeah. And then one day I went to the second pint. Like I just started another one and then finished the second pint. Oh, and I thought that is a bad crossing over. Yeah, that is. Are you back to red meat? I haven't gone back to red meat. Yeah. I went back to chicken. I didn't eat chicken for about a, a year or so. Right. And I, I should reduce that. But then whenever you try to eat healthy, people are like, yeah, when you eat chicken, you're basically just eating like shit. They just sit in their own shit all day long. Like, <laughs> you know, and then they like, yeah, when you eat fish, it's all, you're just eating like tiny plastic. <laughs> like the, the whole fish is basically tiny plastic granules. Oh, God. You know, when you're having lettuce, it's just like, uh, it's rocket fuel. Because where they do it, they have, they fly the rocket. So, I know. And then I just want to kill myself. Like, there's no, there's no, yeah, there's no justice. There's no, there's no like <laughs> guilt free anything no. anymore. Then there's, you just want to go to Wendy's and have a chicken sandwich. I know. I would say I have this app on my phone that, um, that, it's about bird ID, I think mm. it's called. Mm. And you literally open up the app when you have birds in your yard mm -hmm. and there's you're oh. here and you can, you can either take pictures of them or you can just press record Yeah, and it takes their songs 
and it shows you, oh, there's a house wren in your yard, and there's a oh, wow. bluebird, in, and it shows you the thing. And I was like, this is so nice, and I showed it to my wife, and she's like, yeah, I wonder how many birds there were, you know, like 10 years ago. I was like, oh. <laughs> I thought he was going I wonder how many <laughs> Russian bots are now <laughs> tracking your movements because right. you yeah. showed them where you live. <laughs> yeah, there's like, right, exactly. There's either spies or there's global warming yeah. or there's just like, there, can we just enjoy yeah. the house rent for a second? <laughs> I mean, not to slide it into a plug, but I will anyway. Is it, So I made this George Carlin documentary uh, and George Carlin, uh, at the end of his life, when he was doing stand-up, yeah. he switched his point of view to everything is falling apart, so I'm just going to enjoy watching it. Yeah, I'm going to root for it. And, and it was a very weird point of view, and at the time, people were split about it. I loved it. But he just said very clearly, we have fucked up the world, yeah. we have fucked up the earth, we're being cruel to each other, the human race is a shit show. I think he said, when you're born into the human race, uh, front. You, you, you're, you get a ticket to the freak show, and when you're born in America, you get a front row seat. Right. And his whole thing was, I'm just going to love it. And I think I, the bit I remember it starting with is yeah. when you go see a, like a like a car race, how you like root for, a, for the crash, a, for the crash <laughs> that he's rooting for like the end of the human race. Yeah. And he would do these long bits where he would explain how much he loves when things are on fire and accidents. And, uh, and I, I have to say, as I'm 54, I'm beginning to slide into that point of view because... It is a result of, if we don't seem to be fixing anything, and mentally I need a place to sit. That's it. That allows me to not be stressed all day long. That's exactly it. I, I had the same thing. I love the documentary, by the way. Thank you. It's uh, going to be on HBO Max on May the 20th. 20th, and oh. it'll be on HBO. And thank you well. for sending it to me early. It was, yeah. I literally, uh, I'll get back to that point, to the point we were making, but I love Carlin. You know, I've got a painting of him in my, in my office. And I was like, All right, yeah, I know George's story. I, you know, I, yeah. it, it, I'll watch it for Judd, but this is yeah. good. And there's so much new footage and angles that I didn't know about. And I really thought I knew everything about him. So yeah. that kudos to you for that. That was like. No one knew anything because he never talked about his family on stage. Yeah. And he didn't really talk about anything personal other than when he was a kid he talked about some stuff about being a kid and class clown but he didn't talk about raising his daughter kelly or his, or his, his mom marriage. or and it's intense stuff i mean it's he, real intense really he, intense uh, stuff but uh, even just the show business stuff i mean you, you uh you you really just mine the the hell out of it um that's the hoarding because if you right. say to me uh george carl had this incredible career hundreds of spots on tv yeah maybe thou a thousand Jeez. as a hoarder part of me goes how do i get people to see it yeah Th like i feel bad that somewhere there's a tonight show from 1974 right. that's genius <laughs> that no one will watch anymore like that's my psychological problem is it actually right. bothers me right so to be able to excavate excavate it and go, oh, I got to show you this clip of him and Richard Pryor on the John David Summer Show in the mid-60s <laughs> yeah. where they're wearing sweaters, <laughs> telling the worst corny jokes before they figured themselves out. Like the joy to like yeah. offer that to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dinner is unavoidable in that it's something we plan around almost every day. You're always thinking about what to make. And as, we, as you know from listening to this podcast, um, cooking shopping prepping all of it is stuff that we love to do uh it also is a difficult thing to fold into your life sometimes sometimes you need some assistance and that's where you get the good people at every plate america's best value meal kit every plate helps you skip the tedious trips to the grocery store and delivers everything you need to cook consistently affordable and delicious meals choose from 17 weekly recipes and then sit back they will deliver pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards right to your door it is nice when you don't have to do the thinking Sometimes when I, I love thinking about it, that's great. And then, you know, there's a lot of days in a week. <laughs> there's a lot of people in my house. And there's a lot of times when you're just looking at them like, what do you want? And nobody's going to say, let's make something fresh. They're going to say, let's just order something. And then you end up just ordering from the same places. It's not that great for you. This is where they come in. Are you tired of eating chicken and rice on repeat? 
Every plate offers a wide range of mouth watering meat, seafood, veggie options, and more. Plus, you can swap out proteins, veggies, and sides to your liking. If you go to everyplate.com, that's everyplate.com, for just $1.79 per meal, you're going to enter the code PAPA179 and you will get every plate's meals up to $104 value. Try every plate for just $179 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code PAPA179. Good ingredients, good guidance, meals for you for the entire week. You can't lose. Now say you're at uh, the end of your day and you're going into bed and you're wondering why you're tired after the whole day. Why were you tired all day? Why did you not uh, kill it today? Maybe because you're a little cranky. Why are you cranky? Maybe because you didn't get a great night's sleep. Your mattress is the most important thing in your life. Let's admit it. I mean, your spouse is pretty great. Your kids are probably pretty cool and you like your career. If you don't have a good mattress, come on, it's, you're not going to get a good sleep. And a lot of times we forget that it's time to upgrade your mattress and you just ride it for years, for years. You ever uh, take all your sheets off your mattress and go to turn it upside down and rotate it when you do that little stop gap and it looks all nasty? It's because it is nasty. It's time to get a new mattress, guys. This is what you do with Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep, you go on to their website and you take their little sleep quiz and it matches your body type and your sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. They have several different mattress models to choose from. They have soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down when you, if you sleep hot and even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size folks. I took the quiz. My wife and I have different desires on what we like with our mattresses um mine is right hers is wrong and helix <laughs> can accommodate that by giving you a mattress that makes both of you happy it is voted number one best overall mattress pick for 2020 by gq and wired magazine so just go to helixsleep.com slash papa take their two minute sleep quiz they'll match you to the customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life a 10-year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free they'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it but you will helix is offering up to 200 dollars off all mattress orders plus two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash papa. Just go to helixsleep.com slash papa, take the quiz, and you'll start to see that you're in good hands and you will get, be getting good sleep and you won't be so cranky and you won't get in fights with people on the road and your life will be better. It, that, that was kind of the problem with it. Was <laughs> There was a, a bunch of things where you're like, I want to see the rest of this. I want to see the rest of this thing when he, yeah. him and his wife, when he's got yes. that weird hair and him and his wife are actually on this panel. They're on a morning show in LA. Yeah. And it's the early seventies. And he had a very funny kind of almost like professor like attitude in certain spaces and in interviews. Yeah. It was a little condescending. Mm -hmm. I can't say I liked it. Like he had a gear mm -hmm. that was like explaining what I do right. here, yeah. especially in the early 70s. Right. And he's on his show and talking to these like kind of what seems like religious type morning show people. I think they were yeah, the it did. It LA seems... morning show, like, yeah. maybe like you know, AMLA back then. And he's just talking about how he does drugs at a time when no one said that. Yeah. And also talked about that he thought it was okay for his daughter to smoke pot. Yeah. That... And these people look like they were going to have a heart attack. I know. They were like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> And his wife agrees with him. Right. And, and then Kelly said to me, when we, when we found it, his daughter. Yeah. Oh, my mom is hammered on that show. Like yeah. she's drunk. Yeah. And, but he really wanted to say at a time when people really hadn't started saying it yet, that big pharma wants you attack, uh, wants you, uh, addicted to these drugs, mm -hmm. whether it's like diet pills or whatever. And, yeah. and the alcohol industry wants you addicted to this and they've just randomly decided that pot is bad when maybe it's better than all of it. Yeah. And so, you know, 40 years before it got legalized, he was telling the country, this makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. He, it was really it was really uh, 
remarkable and that's what was so kind of upsetting i was one that was upset at the end Mm -hmm. when he's searching and searching and searching but he always had a little bit of hope and then at the end it actually at the very end he kind of gave in a little bit yeah and showed a little hopefulness yeah but it's a fascinating thing because he's so dark his act is so dark so dark and it's a diatribe against people for not making better choices about how they take care of each other how they take care of the earth yeah because he was an environmentalist from the late sixties, he talked about it. Yeah, and so he was kind of like, ah, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> he turns about his, it. His attitude, and then Roseanne has him on her talk show, in the I guess it's in the nineties. Yeah, and she says, I think that you're positive and that this is a joke stance because you're disappointed in us. And he admitted it. Yeah, and she was relentless too. She yeah. wasn't. She didn't just like lob a question. She really stated. Yeah. I'm not buying it. You wouldn't. Yeah. You are. You you do have hope. You are. Yeah. You're tricking us. Yeah. And I always thought that that's what it was. Uh-huh. That he's basically saying, "Who cares?" To get the audience to go like, "I care." Right. That he he went so far as to push you back into the light. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look. Because at he it. he said he goes, you know, beneath a cynic is a disappointed idealist. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, but I do think that's an end of your life. You know, when you get to be in like your 60s, you start going, well, it's not going to get cleaned up while I'm around. Mm-hmm. So I guess I don't give a shit. Well, Are that's you going to do anything? Yeah. I mean, that's what you were saying before. And, and I, I had the same thought when I was in my 30s. I was watching that and I was like, and I remember telling people there was that one special. I'm like, he didn't give us any hope in that one. Yeah. <laughs> and that really, I, I, that was really upsetting. And now I I do know what you're saying. Like to be able to say, fuck it. It's hilarious what's yeah. happening. It's I hope the Democrats and the Republicans devour each yeah. other. I hope the, we run out of water because it's a cop out because yeah. you're realizing I'm not going to be able to do it. He puts it on you. He, but yeah. And you accept it because it's it's more comforting than feeling guilty in your nice yeah. house thinking Oh, maybe we shouldn't fill the pool up. <laughs> <laughs> but as a 30 year old, do you think when you saw it that it made, not that it made you take action, but do you think that your reaction was, I don't like it? Like it got under your skin in a way that would lean you positive to wanting to fix something. It definitely lingered. It <laughs> definitely made you think, right? Yeah, it like definitely a got in like your... him. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't running out to soup kitchens and like helping yeah. people out, but it, for someone who does care, yeah, it stuck. It's to this day. Yeah. It was like, oh man, what was he doing? Like, so what did that mean he... it worked? It did work. It, 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 it did work. I, that's how I look at it now when I yeah. watch it. I think the world has gotten worse. Mm-hmm. So all of his premises are correct. I know because he was like, you know, we get the shitty politicians we vote for, yeah. and he. Uh, and he, he said, you're letting people control you. You're letting corporate forces control politics. And yeah. and then you go, it didn't, it didn't get better. So I guess he wasn't dark enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think about that part when when you're talking to Jerry? And that's a great and, and Jerry has Jerry always has that stance of and Vonnegut kind of went to there also mm-hmm. at a certain point, who was kind of in between yeah. Jerry and, and George. But Jerry essentially was saying, no one's mind gets changed from a joke. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Goose said that I'll think, I'll, I'll change what I think of that comedian yeah. because they were so good at being able to put that into a joke. Yeah. But no one, you're not changing the world with comedy is yeah. basically what he was saying. And it's in a great moment because other people are saying that he was. Yeah. And then you go to Jerry is like, Jerry's no. Like, no. <laughs> and uh, which is so great. Like, Jerry. Yeah. Right. Totally. He's like, I love it, but I don't love it because of, of the, it's political. He's, I don't believe in the philosopher comedian. Yeah. I believe in the funny comedian. And he was, and he made me want to be a comedian. And so he's like giving him praise, but saying, yeah, that's not the thing I'm praising him about. I think the material is incredible and funny. Yeah. And, uh, because that's, you know, Jerry's not trying to change people's minds. He's the no growth. He's the no learning guy. Right. But there are people who are like, no, I want to change people's minds. Although in the book I interviewed a uh, Samantha B mm-hmm. and I asked her this question because she has her incredible show where she talks about politics every day. And she said, I don't think I'm changing anyone's mind. Mm -hmm. I think I'm telling people who basically agree with me that they're not crazy. And I thought, that's great. She's like, I'm like, I'm uh, lifting the spirits of uh, people who are fighting for ideas that I believe in. 
And you're not losing those people. Yeah. You're at least keeping them on the team. You're, you're the coach saying, we, we can still do this. Yeah. One thing that we found when we were going through all of George's stuff was a letter from Jerry mm. to George just saying, I, I can't believe how great that special was. And it was one of his darkest specials. Yeah. And it was this beautiful letter from Jerry wow. just saying how everything was perfect. Jerry wrote his obituary or his, uh, and for the New York Times. Really? He wrote, yeah, it's really good. Uh, he wrote the op-ed mm -hmm. um, after George's passing, and it's really well written and really respectful. And the thing that I, that I really remember from it was how we're all, as comedians, we're all thinking like, what subjects can we get? What what new, what jokes can we yeah. tell? What 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 can we touch on? What can we talk about? And basically paraphrasing just know that George was already there before you. <laughs> like he had mined so much. He covered all that. Covered like, yeah. all of it. Well, he would seem to be the first person you really noticed was putting out a new hour, what felt like every two or three years, where there was a new special. Yeah. And as a young person who wanted to be a comedian, there were people that you, you saw that they never changed their act. Yeah. Their whole lives, Don Rickles, like it's yeah. the same act. And then suddenly George Carlin, and, and to a lesser extent Robert Klein, were mm -hmm. putting out a lot of material yeah and it was seemed so impressive like oh my yeah. god he writes a new set i mean no one wrote new sets that you knew of no back god. then oh in, my in god the early 80s i mean it was the beginning of okay there's a second special from richard jenny or right or somebody like, yeah oh he was the first person richard jenny yeah. where you were like oh he's an incredible comedian and writer right and he can keep making these right yeah exactly but there wasn't the there wasn't the pressure to do it. There wasn't, mm -hmm. and George just kind of put it on himself. Yeah. Like now everybody can stream and everybody can yeah. see stuff and Louie was a big part of it too. And there was no Leno special back then. Right, Like right. that was also like a, his point of view, which is why would I give my act out? I want to do it and change it and, and have it. it grow, but I don't want to put it. Yeah, it'll burn, why would I burn my act? He always yeah. says, it, my act feeds me, my act pays me. Like, why would I just give that away? I remember him saying that to me on the set of The Tonight Show. Yeah. I was like, what? I thought that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> it's just keep putting stuff out there. But it's an interesting arc with, and this is another kind of cool thing from the special that I didn't really, that was like a, a cool like new thing for someone who knew and knew everything about, thought he knew everything about Carlin was when you look at the scope, like 40 years of him doing, like we all know the story of, oh, he started out pretty straight and then he becomes yeah. hippie and then he, but there's so many other arcs in it, which of course, for someone who cares, it is going to dip yeah. because you couldn't keep like, he, he comes out and he changes and he's, and the war is happening and all this stuff is so ripe for commentary. If you're railing against the system, it's all there, but you can't keep that up. Yeah, You've got to, and he, has that kind of a thing which I would call maybe a dip in his career yeah. for different reasons. And there's like drugs and there's other stuff, but I think more than anything, he just had to hang around and gather up information about the landscape to understand it again. It's not something you could comment every year. He needed yeah. to take like a, a beat and come back 15 years later with more potency. And I think that he had to keep working. So in these periods where he probably was running out of gas, yeah. I mean, if you put out like five albums, yeah. you could see that the sixth one would be scraping bottom for a little while. Yeah, of course. And so he needs the money because he didn't pay his taxes for a few years. It was vague as to what went wrong. I, yeah. <laughs> I, we right. never could get to the bottom of was it yeah. a choice? Was it a mistake? He probably was just on a lot of drugs. Who knows? Maybe he was anti-government or at the time. I, I, we couldn't get the answer. Couldn't. But the, the interest was enormous uh, you know it was like the days of willie nelson where like you know people would really get buried by yeah. having made mistakes with their taxes uh, now no how, one pays taxes how, how broke was he <laughs> did you know that part of it like was he uh, it, it, was he it, struggling for a long period it really just felt like he had to stay on the road he to pay it to. off so he just wasn't home as much as he needed to be as a parent and a family person because it, it wasn't like now where like somebody like jerry seinfeld can go out friday saturday right and you know, do some big shows, yep. do really well, yeah. and then hang out with their kids. Yeah, I mean, back then you would go out for three weeks. He was gone. You know, you were not f flying. You know, 
you know, in the easiest way. And you were yeah. driving a lot. And I think later on, I think he Commercial did. Commercial. I think he did get a plane. He did get a plane. Point. Yeah, he talks about being on the plane with the coke. Yeah, doing cocaine <laughs> alone on his plane, <laughs> yeah. which is because he didn't do coke with people. Yeah, he did it alone. It was yeah. like a almost again like a. OCD thing or an attention thing like he was self-medicating because his I think his mind just raced and raced and he yeah. loved writing and he would sit alone and listen to music and write and mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't a social thing right it was but, to keep going yeah. to keep the engine going but I always think it's like a band it's like you two or something you put out three or four great records and then you experiment and it either works or it doesn't and mm -hmm. then maybe you have one that's you know not like one of the better ones mm -hmm. and then out of the blue it explodes again yeah and you break you do Octung baby or something yeah and then you're searching again. And when you have a 40, 50 year career, right? you know, it has to, you have to have a fallow periods and your fans stick with you. It's like, I'll watch any Coen brothers film, mm -hmm. Tarantino film, yeah. because you're just, you know, they're, they paid all their, you fell in love with them yeah. and you don't care if like what happens, it's just yeah. like, you're going to go for the ride. And he did have that following that like stayed with him. But the cool part about him too, is that he, even up to the end was still getting young people. Like it, it wasn't just an old crowd that aged with him. Mm -hmm. He was, why do you think that was? Why do you think young people were always into him? Yeah, I don't know because like I, I go to concerts of people that I liked yeah. 30 years ago right. and the crowd is my age yeah and and there's some younger people but they're not really replenishing right there's a great steely dan book uh, donald fagan wrote a diary of being on the road with uh -huh. steely dan what? about f five years ago uh -huh. and what's hilarious is him just talking about how old the crowd is there's really <laughs> hilarious <laughs> entries like it looks like the crowd was on an iron lung tonight and <laughs> he's really dark and hysterical about it but you do notice it i noticed it when i did carnegie yeah. hall yeah. i was like these people are all 50 years old. Right. Every single person. Yeah. Here. I have not lured a 20 year old <laughs> I know. to this cardio. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking about it. Like the, he had the elements, the things that I always loved about him. And maybe this we'll see what you think of this. He, he was, he would talk about weighty stuff, but he would also be silly. Yeah. And you know, in your, in your documentary, you talk about, he's doing this whole thing on farts. And I always remember <laughs> Carnegie hall. He's like, you know, doing all this stuff, but he's also being a crab walking across the, <laughs> across the stage. But do you think that another part of it is that he seemed dangerous? Like young people, if you curse more, if you yeah. if like, it, it seems, and maybe it's just the cursing. It makes it seem for a 16 year old, it makes it seem dangerous, and so yeah. you want to lean into it. Do you think there's something yeah. to that? And he's angry, like a teenager. Uh huh. He's he's pissed, and uh -huh. he's doing something that a lot of people and a lot of like adults don't like. He's, yeah. he's troubling people, right? And I think that uh, you know he's saying things that you're not supposed to say mm -hmm. out loud. I mean, you know, in the early seventies, he's doing bits about, you know, going to church and just not believing anything they were saying. Yeah. I mean, he went very, yeah. you know, anti, uh, God. Right. And he has big bits about the dangers of people, but being spiritual and, and mm -hmm. believing God and, and how it, uh, manipulates you. And, yeah. you know, even if you disagree with him, it's fascinating, hardcore yeah. approach. I mean, there's that one joke where he says, you know, uh, the sacredness of life, sacredness of life. He goes, religion is like the number one uh, cause of death. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. I love the way he describes God, like this magical man in the sky. That they, and he's like, he hates you and he'll devour you and he'll put you in hell if you, if you're bad, but he loves you. <laughs> <laughs> you give him money. He loves you. Right. He kiss his ass enough. Right, right. He loves you and he needs money. <laughs> and in, and the, in the last week or two, you know, because of all that's happening with Roe versus Wade, yeah. he has the, the best bit about that amazing and it just goes around the internet but he just captures the whole thing and it's all about uh yeah you know conservatives like you uh when you're uh in the womb and after that they don't yeah. give a fuck, fuck you when you're what does he say like when you're pre-born uh they like you and when you're preschool you're fucked right. you know? <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to pay for anything yeah, no medicare uh, no health care no welfare no yeah. nothing yeah, he. It's amazing because when the row thing happened, and you're like, 
his take is like you you're thinking as a comedian like what is the take what is the thing and when he just comes out basically says no they're just against women yeah. they just don't like women they don't want women to have power you're like yeah he, he nailed it yeah. i mean that's still it, it, it hasn't changed and the environment the, the thing about the earth just shrugging off yeah. the uh humans <laughs> yes <laughs> that's, the, the that earth thing, will be fine that circulated like a yeah. couple of years ago that circulated well he you, has that bit where he says what would the earth do if there was these people on it like hurting it and he basically says it would create the earth would create aids yeah create and, a virus and, like and create viruses to like get rid of the thing that was the annoying it <laughs> yeah, and, right. and hurting it. And yeah, his, that was his whole thing. The yeah. earth will be fine. We're, we're fucked. We're fucked. We're the ones who will disappear. <laughs> it's so perfect. And it's so dark and, and troubling, I, you know. Yeah. But he, he had all these little post-it notes with lines and, and, and one of them just said like, I just want the audience to know I'm thinking. Right. You know, it, I, it, yeah. Which is a great way to look at it. I know. It's not like you don't have to agree with everything. I'm just, I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm, I'm kicking it around and, uh, there, yeah, there were all these other notes. One said, uh, you know, in America, it's all about seduction and then betrayal. You get seduced into believing something mm. and then betrayed. Mm. And I think he felt that way about a lot of politics. Wow. What was it like? What did he have? Like, was it notebooks? Was it tons of handwritten stuff? Like, what was around? He seemed like he was one of those, we'll write on anything people. Uh huh. So there's notebooks, but a lot of post-it notes. Like, Shanling didn't really have a world of tons of post-it notes uh -huh. and index cards. What was yeah. funny about going through all of Gary Shandling's stuff, because uh -huh. <laughs> you see like the history of him trying to figure out how to be a writer. Right. And in the beginning, he did try to write all his jokes on index cards, where every joke uh -huh. was on a separate <laughs> index card. And he literally even had a little, like a filing system. I found like a little box, <laughs> yeah. but you could tell he gave up on it in like two days. <laughs> like he spent the night writing it all out on different cards and then yeah. has the little dividers with the topics and then never <laughs> looked at it again. <laughs> but, uh, I found, uh, on a wall, uh, on a cork board, mm -hmm. you know, there was all these magazines and things that maybe things that inspired Gary in his office. Yeah. You know, when you like, you put things on a cork board and then you never do it again for the next 20 years, but yeah. it just sits it on your cork there. board. <laughs> yeah. It's like stuck in time. Uh huh. Uh, but he had this joke and it said, a lot of people ask me where I was on nine 11 and I say, which one I had 28 bad nine 11. <laughs> And he never did that joke, but it was just sitting there. It's great. <laughs> on, on the what board. did you, I was thinking about that on the way over, because you take these, you know, you have, you have a lot of comedy with both of your books mm -hmm. and just all your interviews from a kid. And you've just always been a student of it and, and dove into it. Uh, I guess this is a two part question. You took deep dives though with, with Shanling and with Carlin. Um, uh, the first question is what is the differences? Cause they're both geniuses. Mm -hmm. What did you come away with? Like what was similar and what was, what was different about them? Yeah. Cause they are different, but they, there are, there are more similarities than I thought. Uh huh. I mean, Gary was a real, he was a real writer. He also loved to discover things on stage. He liked to play with the audience and he could write on his feet mm -hmm. and he was really trying to get to the truth of himself and george carlin was uh -huh. not george carlin wasn't going on stage dis discussing how george carlin feels why he's behaving the way he behaves yeah he was a social commentator mm -hmm. and he was fascinated by language and behavior but not his behavior right so he has some there's some random things here and there but a shockingly small amount of self-exploration. Yeah. But Gary was all self-exploration. Right. But they had similar moms. Mm -hmm. Just in a sense that Gary had your classic smothering, controlling, kind of neurotic, uh, and in the end, pretty toxic mom. Right. You know, Gary wanted loved, to marry him. <laughs> yes, yes, that was his joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, he had that great joke where he said, you know, his mom said she wanted to marry him and that he said it to his therapist and the therapist just went, like did the, yeah, did the expression that the <laughs> blackjack dealers do. Um, Gary had a great joke where he said, I want to, uh, you know, usually the, it's like, you know, Mrs. Uh, Gary Shandling, but he always said he wants to, get a woman to change her first name and her last name. So you can say, this is my wife, Gary Shandler. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so 
George Carlin's dad was really abusive. So when George Carlin was one, the mom like ran away with uh, George and his older brother, Patrick, who he was already abusing. Who was a pisser, by the way. What a great guy that was. Hysterical, the coolest God. guy. He just passed away a few weeks ago, oh, like 90. Oh. So funny. Man, I, it's, it's like if Carlin never left a trailer park. Like if George yeah. Carlin just stayed the, and, and just was complaining from his chair. Then. And he sold cars, and I think he wrote on the George Carlin show, like did yeah. Life, where he did everything. Yeah. And at the end of his life, lived in Woodstock. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but... I think he also was amused for him, his attitude, uh, his he, older brother. Yeah, keep the New Yorker, keep the, right, he brought, when he brought him on the TV show. Yeah. He said, I, what, is my, what do you want me to do, George? He said, keep, me, keep the New Yorker true or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he knew, like, he would yeah. tell me if I had slipped. Yeah. He became an L.A. guy when I'm doing yeah. a show that's very New York. <laughs> but, uh, so the mom takes him and they, they leave, they run away just to raise him alone. But she's yeah. a very strong uh I guess Tough. drove him crazy being controlling and everything. You know, there were some parents back then, especially who were like, what you do is a reflection on me. Mm -hmm. And it's all about their enjoyment of it or them feeling good about it. Yeah. And that was certainly a relationship that was uh, difficult yeah. for him. Yeah. And Gary had a similar situation with a very controlling Jewish mom who right. didn't want him to talk about his brother dying. We found this incredible video where the dad oh, right. started telling the story about how Gary did well in spite of the fact that his brother passed when, right. when he was a kid from cystic fibrosis. And as he's telling it to some interviewer who's doing a piece about Gary, the, his mom says, no, we don't want to talk about that here. And you can tell that's what the house was. Like, right. we don't want to grieve. We just want to never talk about it. Ordinary people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then uh, there's an amazing thing in the documentary where George Carlin brings his mom out on the Mike Douglas show. And his mom is so happy and so confident and starts so, telling yeah. a story about George and she kills. Yeah. And he looks like he is in so much pain. I know. Watching it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and his mom even like starts the thing off by saying how she loves Michael Douglas. Like, and not George. And not George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's rough. So they had that connection. And also I think yeah. George Cohn in his life landed in a philosophy that was similar to Gary's, which was... I don't know if it's Buddhism or just a sense of that we're all connected mm. and we have to lift each other up. Mm -hmm. And I think George talked about it almost like we're all part of the big electron. We're all, and I think his daughter Kelly said that from taking acid, he had that feeling of mm. we're all one. Mm -hmm. And that is where Gary was at the end of his life. So even though their material, right, their exploration right. was different, they both uh, believed that. Right. Yeah. It was interesting. It was, George had these moments, like it was only in interviews though, where he would almost choke up. Like he would talk about, you know, how much he loves people or loves yeah. running into people. Doesn't and, like groups. Doesn't though. like groups. Yeah. <laughs> I love people yeah. <laughs> on an individual basis. What a great line. Yeah. Yeah. And then <laughs> he's, he's like, when you have groups sooner or later, they, they start wearing hats. They start wearing <laughs> 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 Which is funny because the, the Trump thing is all the hat, right? Yeah. And like, and like yeah. George again. Carlin saw none of that. He's like, pretty soon they're wearing hats. They're pretty wearing hats. Yeah. And visiting you in the night or something like that. Or, yeah. Uh, but it's interesting, like, I wonder why George didn't want to talk about it on stage ever. Like, there was never that, like, he never really did. There was never... I wonder if it's because he really had a serious drug problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. His wife had a serious alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. A lot of it from being left alone while he was on the road and not uh. having a sense of her own purpose. And then she found it later in life. And maybe he was just ashamed of yeah. what he was as a parent. Because yeah. he didn't want to explore what was happening and maybe it wasn't something that he felt like he could talk about truthfully without self-examination that would be difficult for someone who was addicted. Yeah. As a comedian and a good dad, uh, do you think he could have been George Carlin if he had been like, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to focus on my family more? Uh, probably. I mean, I don't know if people knew how to do that back then. Right. I think that they didn't. Uncharted. Well, I think that comedians have figured out so many ways to make the life work. Yeah. Like this. You, you have point. a podcast, so you don't have to be on the road constantly. You have something right. else that you do. Yeah. You, know, you can make you, films. You, you can make films. You can act. You can, you know, uh, host things. You can like we've all found like a, a tons of ways yeah. to make a living. And he right. did. He, you know, he had books and he would act. But I don't think that. 
the system yeah. was built yet because there were comedy clubs which he did not do right and they were theaters and he felt the need to be on TV a lot to keep his exposure high mm -hmm. so that people would buy the tickets because when if he put his show on sale it was a couple of thousand yeah when you don't sell you're really screwed right. and I think I think he was stuck in a cycle of very hard work it's a he, great point. He, he didn't figure out the hustle yeah. that allowed him to do it less. Because it didn't exist yet. He was kind of one of the first yeah. guys touring that way. Like We were all privy to all the information and how it works and what you can do. And like when you, merch. He wasn't moving the merch. Yeah, he wasn't he never a merch guy, <laughs> right? Exactly. He wasn't selling stuff online. Yeah. <laughs> and also, he probably didn't make that much money yeah. on his specials. Yeah. And it, it, it just it wasn't like crazy lucrative as it has become yeah. for some people now. Right, right. Well, that's, for the people at his level, like it, like he yeah. would be, you know, Bill Burr right now. Right. You know. Right. But he, I don't think he ever really got to that like Madison Square Garden place. No. You know, I think he was in those whatever one to six thousand seaters. Yeah. For most of his his life, and it was probably hard to move you know, move those tickets all the time. Oh God, yeah, hustling and going and doing press and just. When she talked about, and Kelly talked about him being so tired, he was just so yeah. tired at that point. And then he gets the TV show and is working harder than he ever exactly. was. He thought that was the easy road, was the yeah. sitcom. And then he's fighting with uh, Sam Simon, who created The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, and he realized, oh, this is a completely different war. Yeah, and it was 14-hour days there. It's like, I'm not getting on a plane, but I'm still not Well, he home. got Chandling's life, which was, right? it buries you. Yeah. It takes everything from you. I mean, there's yeah. a great line from Seinfeld when he's talking to Gary. Uh, I think it's in the documentary where he says, you know, when you do these TV shows, you know, it's a, it's, it's, you're in a, a fight with your show and the show always wins. Like you yeah. quit. Yeah. Like sooner or later, right. it's one way or another, you get defeated by your show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always remember Jerry would say, uh, TV eats people. Yeah. It does. And people, <laughs> I don't think people really understand how much work it takes and yeah. how much mental work. Yeah. Like when you think about Seinfeld, how many, episodes that him and Larry made right and had to figure out and think through and Oof. perform and edit each one yeah. could take a year off of your life god now what do you what's your been your experience in the balance of your life and your you know you have a successful family yeah. but also a successful career the balance of film and and your life well i'm Is always it, thinking about that that's all that's all i i think about and I, I have to say, I do look back now that my kids are out of the house, like freshly out of the house, and I think, well, Leslie, I made big sacrifices to be around mm -hmm. and to build it around them, and I think, I think we did pretty good. Yeah. You know, we were, we were around, and you know, we still found a way to do projects. Like, you know, during the pandemic, you know, we were all in the house, and we were yeah. having a nervous breakdown, and we, <laughs> we, I knew, like we needed to get out of the house. Like right. it, it, it was bad and I had this idea for the bubble and I thought maybe I could get somebody to let me make a movie about what's happening and yeah. it'd be s small and like a, mm -hmm. a small cast and contained and we, me and Leslie and Iris can do it together yeah. and still support each other during a difficult time but while working and not just stuck in the house yeah, learning staring how at to each make other. pizza and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, making bread. <laughs> and so we, we always thought about that. That's what This Is 40 is. That's what working together on funny people and knocked up is how yeah. can we have our lives connect? Right. And not all the time we go almost, uh, uh, you know, five years not doing it. It wasn't yeah. constant, but it, it was recurring Yeah, uh, that we would say, how do we shoot in the Valley? How do we shoot a, can you shoot a movie in Brentwood? <laughs> right. You, you know, there was one time where we bought a house and we were shooting, this is 40, and we literally moved down the street from the house in the movie where we shot. And I would just walk like 800 yards <laughs> to the house. Like that was the ultimate setup we were going for. Yeah. It, I watched this great, and I'm, I, I, it was great. It was on Turner Classic. It was about um, Harold. He was a storyboarder mm -hmm. a, a, and his wife, who was a researcher for film, I'm, this is embarrassing that I'm forgetting their names. It was a, a documentary done like in the 80s, maybe in the 90s. And it was about this couple and she was an orphan and he had his own thing and they, they built the life together. And 
they were very successful. I mean, they worked on everything. She was this researcher, like in Paramount, like mm-hmm. tons of books and getting all this stuff for all these great films. And he was doing all the stuff for The Graduate. Yeah. And I mean, all these amazing, <laughs> and working with all these great people. And the one thing that from the documentary that stuck out, which is in line with what you're talking about, how, how you succeeded, was that they realized he was, he couldn't survive a marriage if he was off in Budapest working for eight months yeah. and she was in LA in the research library and not having some commonality in their life, you're now living two separate lives. You needed to share, you have to have common experience mm-hmm. and how do we do that? How do we bring these two things together? Otherwise, what is a marriage? Yeah, especially in this business, Yeah, it, it, it's hard. You do have to find a way to to be present. And so much of what we enjoy is going on the road right? and, and, you know, making a movie. Yeah. And so if I make a movie, I'm like, okay, I got to live there. Right. <laughs> like if it's not in LA, I'm like, okay, I'm going to New York for three a year. and a half months, yeah. four months, you know, and we only did it once where we moved somewhere. Like the family uh-huh. moved. Yeah. When we did Talladega Nights. Oh, okay. took the whole family and we moved to Charlotte. And of course it ends and then we're, we're all like, should we just stay here forever? We love it here. <laughs> yeah. so you always want to stay there forever. Yeah. But it was a great experience. My kids yeah. went to school there oh, for cool. a semester. Yeah, and, and into like the experience. school, like in the system. Yeah, and we were like, oh, this is what it would be like if we just stayed here and yeah. were not circus people, lived with <laughs> normal, nice people. Right. This, would, this is what that life would look like. And it was hard to then yeah. go back to crazy L.A. Yeah. Um, and, and every once in a while, when my kids, when they would be acting out or we'd be having a real problem, uh-huh. You know, that's when the conversation would be like, we never should have left Charlotte. <laughs> People were normal there. <laughs> that's our, Ours is New Jersey because all our families in New Jersey. People are just normal there. Just yeah. act like normal kids. Yeah. <laughs> they don't need this giant thing for a party. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your, is it your, is it your, in your self-analysis, is it your ADD or is it your love of comedy <laughs> that keeps you cranking out all of this stuff. I mean, you're always, yeah. you're always, always making stuff, showing up as a stand up. Like that is an obsession, like more than anyone else. Like everybody has their yeah. things, but you devour and, t- and you, you're f- thankfully for all of us, you're cultivating all of this mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, just to have these two books yeah. in my office. <laughs> I mean, really just to flip open, you know, is an amazing thing. What is it? What part of you is, do you think it started as ADD and morphed into love of comedy? I don't know. It's a good question because another ADD thing that happened was <laughs> when I was a kid, I would sit in my room and I had this chair, this uh-huh. like weird metal chair, and I would lean back against my armoire and I would watch like Mike Douglas and Dinosaur every day. Like, for, like, as soon as I got home, for like two hours they would be on. And then I watched Live at Five with Sue Simmons and Chad Cafferty. With some ribs from Beefsteak Charlie's. <laughs> and then I'd watch all like with the sitcoms and Cheers or whatever. And then I'd watch Carson Letterman. But all I was like leaning back in this chair. And I used to, and I had this weird OCD thing or I don't know what it is. I, I thought it was like an uh, obsessive compulsive thing where I would tap along with them talking th- th- and count their syllables uh-huh. and having and I and I'd have to end on a po- on a even uh-huh. and then I would start it again and do it for a while and then have to end on an even and I would just do it the whole time almost not even knowing I'm doing it right I've done it my whole life my wife started noticing I was doing it with my toes like flicking my toes while I'm watching TV no and then one day I like went online and just happened to stumble into some article that said, yeah. it's some form of calming yourself. Like, like they, now they teach like tapping is a thing right. that calms you down. Right. And I, whatever it is, it was some weird human instinct that I don't, I don't yeah. know if it connects the two sides of your brain, but that the tapping and the counting is a grounding in uh-huh. some way. So lately I've, I've been thinking, I don't know what the hell my brain is doing. Yeah. I don't really quite yeah. understand because it is racing and running and wanting to think and wanting to work. But lately it's also exhausted <laughs> and it's just like, why don't you stop? <laughs> right. And every once in a while we'll go to Hawaii for a week. And I, after two or three days, like I'll find the other gear, the uh-huh. non-work gear. Right. And I get happy in it. Can then, you stay in it? No. Yeah. I mean, I could if I just didn't leave. But in LA, as soon right. as it starts, so much of my drive is 
don't fuck it up. Mm -hmm. So if I'm making a George Carlin documentary, the entire time for two years yeah. in my head, I'm like, seriously, you can't fuck it up. I mean, every comedian <laughs> in the world will think you're the biggest <laughs> idiot ever if you make the shitty George Carlin documentary. And then if you make a movie, you're yeah. like, yeah, oh, I hope this isn't bad because it's going to be everywhere. <laughs> and it's almost like that terror of uh -huh. failure or humiliation yeah. is such a driver, but it feels bad. And so I've tried to get rid of it, but it's it's just that critical voice, and it it does keep me on my toes working. Yeah. But it's so unhealthy. Is it though? I mean, depending on how loud you let it get. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and also you've been successful, so it should quiet down at some point. Yeah. But it doesn't. <laughs> it, right. Exactly. It doesn't. <laughs> because then you just start thinking like, am I like? getting older and lame you know yeah. like it doesn't matter how well you do there's always the voice going like yeah but you don't know what the fuck's going on anymore <laughs> kids are into different shit you're not in sync with anybody and, and, and then know. something goes well and then it's like yeah but the next one won't make sense <laughs> <laughs> I know. but you know what have you ever met anyone that i mean you meet so many people that are successful and have you ever met a really good artist who is content, <laughs> like with their yeah. work? I mean, I think that you just, you always, it's, everything is an experiment. It's like writing a joke. Right. We write a joke at home and we try it tonight. We have yeah. no idea if it will work. Right. And, and the fact that a thousand other jokes have worked does not increase the chances that we're correct. Right. <laughs> I mean, there have been so many jokes. I'm just yeah. so cocky to get out there yeah. and like, there's no noise at all from the audience. And you're like, wow, in my head, I, I felt the rhythm of how this would play. <laughs> and they don't even recognize it as a joke. Yeah, they think like, you're still doing the setup. <laughs> and that, I think, is why we like it, is the cons. You're, only, yeah. you're always on your toes. Yeah, always. No matter how good you are. And I guess we like it. I just would like to... You know, the, the, the thing I've been thinking about lately is a lot this Buddhist idea that you have to become comfortable with how uncomfortable you are mm -hmm. that you're always uncomfortable mm -hmm. and it's okay to live in that yeah and then you just kind of settle into it you know right. like yeah. uh, groundlessness yeah like you know everything is shifting all the time and you just go it's it's fine and that's what comedy is mm -hmm. every moment on stage you have no idea you could be killing and go like this thing could totally fall apart at any second <laughs> you could just lose rhythm or sometimes you just you're performing and you realize you don't even feel anything you're saying. Right. Like sometimes you're in the moment yeah. and like you're really like telling Connecting. a friend and other times like you're just like saying it <laughs> and then the crowd feels it and it just starts getting quieter and quieter. <laughs> same words, almost said the same way. I know, but, but they there's know. nothing behind it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like he's left. He's not here he's anymore. Like, <laughs> he started thinking about dinner. He got tired. You ever get a set like you're at the cellar and it's a 15 minute set and like, you do it really well. Like eight minutes in, you like you feel your body go. I'm tired. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I do this thing lately where you start leaning on the stool, where you just like a couple <laughs> fig games, and it's like this is really just purely out of out of energy, yeah. <laughs> energy loss. Like I'm going to the comedy cellar next week <laughs> because I, I haven't really written any new jokes uh -huh. since the pandemic. Really, so I was busy on the the bubble and the Carlin thing, and I couldn't really figure out what my attitude would, should be mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Like. Am I happy? Am I cynical? Mm -hmm. Am I melancholy? Am I reflective? I don't know. Mm. And I, so I haven't really been doing a lot of stand up, just some Largo shows where I mainly talk to people. Yeah. I convinced Jim Carrey to come in one night. We just talked on stage. It was really? amazing. But I said, damn it, I got to figure this out. So I yeah. called in for like eight zillion sets at the cellar next week. Oh, uh, what? Just for that? <laughs> and now I'm so scared to have nothing to say that I'm writing because <laughs> yeah. I'm really nervous. Oh, but it's it. so, but after one set there, the great thing, because they're not long and yeah. you just kind of get up and it's just, oh, by the, yeah. you're going to get so much work done. You can always bail in eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next comic's happy you got off. <laughs> yeah. And you and I did the th yeah. same thing at Largo. Yeah. Where a couple of times and it, yeah, I, you were definitely searching. You were definitely yeah. kind of feeling it out and we would always naturally come back to our families. Exactly. <laughs> and then every once in a while I'm like. Should I talk about that or the fact that they left the house? Does that mean it's over? Mm -hmm. But then I realized, no, there's a, there's a funny thing happening now. Yeah. Post them leaving. Yeah. Which is about how do you create what this new relationship is where you're not in charge? You, you know, and you're, I, I, I was trying to write something about how you become like their advisor <laughs> right. and they don't have to listen. So you have to be a trusted advisor and you can't get mad when they don't take the advice. Yeah. So you're trying to find a little pocket for yourself <laughs> in their lives where they will right. check in with you. Yeah. Cause the best thing 
ever that happened in all my parenting was one day, out of the blue, Maud just said to me, and maybe she was, in like, she was like 20 or something. She's like, I always remember that time you said to me, and I thought, she remembered a piece of advice? <laughs> and she's like, I remember you told me that Michael J. Fox said in his book, you shouldn't worry about things, bad things happening, because then if they do happen, you just suffered twice. Huh. And she quoted my wow. quote of Michael J. Fox. That's great. And, I, and it was the only time in my stuck. whole life I thought. Yeah. I saw the A B like something stuck. That's yeah, <laughs> like something stuck that wasn't just you doing something stupid in the kitchen. Exactly. <laughs> Dad's an idiot. Yeah, because you think as a parent all the time, like how do I give them the little wisdom yeah. that I found? And yeah, that, that's amazing that it actually yeah. stuck. I haven't gotten yeah. there yet, where they're like, you know. Well, they're honest <laughs> with you afterwards right. so like when they move out and they realize like you can't control them anymore suddenly right. they tell you what they were thinking and what they did uh -huh. so you have this uh, I, I was trying to find a way to write about this uh, where just out of the blue they'll just be like oh yeah I was stoned that whole year <laughs> and you're like what <laughs> You know, and, and they, they they tell you the story. So that's what really happened that night. Yeah. It's like suddenly, like, oh, I thought that happened. No, that's not what happened. Here's what really happened. And they just tell you all these, like, yeah. incidents you never heard about. Oh, I couldn't tell you. They I had to call an ambulance. <laughs> I remember telling my parents things 20 years later. Yeah. about the, and, and they didn't like it. They didn't like hearing it. <laughs> they, because you, it ruins your perception as a parent of yeah. what you were doing and how in control you were and how what a good job you were doing. Yeah. We're kind of the opposite. We're so happy they're telling us it. Oh yeah, I mean, we're I, just so happy that they would tell us now. I know. And and, and oh, completely. That well, that's a, again, that's that's a sign of success in the family that they're, yeah. you know, well, they will hang out with you at all. Like we're going to yes. go on vacation and they're coming with us. And yeah. the idea of going on vacation like as an adult. Right. But my parents was, would not be something I would have considered. <laughs> it, it just wasn't like how everything worked in our family. Right. And I think for most families, I don't know that. But like, yeah. we're just like, come hang out with us. We'll <laughs> make sure, you know, that yeah. it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's one thing that I keep banking on is, well, they're going to be poor for a while. So if they want to do anything. <laughs> that's all you have at some point. Yeah. It's like, you know, you, I'll yeah. fly a first class. I used to do this joke where I said, right. you know, like, uh, where I, I always <laughs> flew my kids first class from when they were little kids. Yeah. I'm like, I worked my whole life to get into first class. I'm not going to fly coach just to teach you values. <laughs> <laughs> How do you how do you figure out where you're going to put your focus? Because like now yeah. you've got this idea for, for I've got to get back on my yeah. stand up and, and mm -hmm. take care of that. But I know without you telling me that there's a film yeah. percolating, there's probably another book percolating, probably another comedy compilation of some port yeah. in the mix. How do you how do you allocate your time and do you feel like do you ever crave giving all of your time to one thing. Yeah. Well, I did that once. I wrote a movie with Owen Wilson in the 90s, and I spent like a couple, a few years on it because I thought, well, that's how like James Brooks does it. He spends like four years on right. a movie writing a script. I'll do it that way. Yeah. Just try to make a masterpiece. Uh -huh. And then like we finished it, and no one would make it. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, it's all about back burners. How many burners can you have going? <laughs> Let's go. Get these plates squirreling up yeah, in the air. <laughs> people will just say no. Right, right. And uh, so, yeah. It, it's a, it is a tough decision because you want to be able to be pulled, you know, mm -hmm. uh, by the undertow in a way. Yeah. So if I meet Lena Dunham mm -hmm. and she has a great idea. Right. And her and, and Jenny Connor want me to help out on girls, it might change the next six years of my life. Like, okay, I'm going to give a, mm -hmm. a pretty big hunk of my bandwidth to this. Right. And so in the era of girls, I'd made very few movies. Right. But I thought, this is like really fun and it's working and I love it and yeah. and it's not burying me. They're working way harder than me. Uh -huh. But I'm writing. You know, I'm right. I'm reading all the scripts, I'm giving them notes, I'm a great like outside uh voice to right. track how everything's going, but I still can be with my kids. I don't have to sit on the set. And it made life work for a long time. Right, right. And then at a certain point, you know, it's like making the bubble. You just go, What is life? like right now yeah. where should we be and now like 
I will think, when is Maud doing euphoria again? Okay, <laughs> so she's not going to talk to me then. And, you know, what's right. Leslie doing? And where's Iris going to be? And then I... I try to figure out, should we do something together? Should, uh -huh. Oh, there's a little hole there where I probably, it would be good to be busy then and not at this other time. Right, So much of it right. is just a time management. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when I make a movie, you think, oh, I have to go away for three months. It's not that, it's the hard part. It's the six month tale of editing. Right. And, and so then if everyone wants to have a little freedom to do something. Yeah. If I'm like, well, I can't leave town for six months <laughs> because I'm editing. It, it becomes like a yeah. year of dad can't be flexible in any way. Right. Right. Which obviously is a great problem to have. But if I decide in that year to go, I'll just do stand up here and there. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. I can have fun, be less stressed. Right. And then if they get a job, I can go live right, in the right. city where they're working. Yeah. So that's, I'm always on my toes wondering, <laughs> you know, do I strike and make something now or uh -huh. just sit around and, right. and or work on the book? Like, oh, I could work on the book from anywhere. And yeah. So it's, so it's more of organizing how the projects are going to fit in your life than what's going to turn you on creatively. Well, both. And then, you know, something will demand Right. You do it. So right. you know, with the King of Staten Island, you know, I felt like, oh, okay, there's this window of time. If yeah. I made a movie with Pete, it will be in a year in that summer. Right. You know, he's free right, from right. SNL. We'll do it that summer. Right. So I need to get the script with him and Dave Cyrus ready for that. Right. And then I'm very passionate about it because I really liked that it was about him sharing his experience and about the sacrifice of firefighters. And I, I, I really loved meeting all those people and trying yeah. to get a story like that out there. Right, exactly. And so then it just pulls me in like, okay, that's worth yeah. this huge hunk of energy. Yeah, right, and right. And then it ends and you're like, okay, I gotta, <laughs> I'll just interview people for a book for a year yeah. so I can recover. <laughs> um, I hope you like the bread. Thank you, sir. I, I hope, will like the I bread. Hope you'll, I'm going to eat it. Do you I'm going to break knife? the fast with the bread. Do you have a good serrated knife? Yes. All right, good. I have these knives. Toast it, put some butter on it. And the, the, I'm going to take the, the pound cake. Bella. I mean, that's where I'll cheat on my fast. This is good. I mean, this is this is a grown-up yeah. lemon thing. The only reason why I'm fasting is there is a moment where you put on a suit and you just go, it doesn't look good. <laughs> that's the only reason why I would ever lose it. Like, I'm on totally. Gobert next week, <laughs> yeah. and it's just... If the gut is it was out wide enough that the whole suit coolness disappears and I, I look like Mel Blanc or something, yeah, right? Exactly. That's, that's what I always think. <laughs> I always want to be. I always want to be Cary Grant, and I know I'm just like a used car salesman, yeah, like Lou Jacoby. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, one last question. You're making all of this stuff, mm -hmm. and you're also a student of comedy and the Carlin part of it and everything. Uh, we're all, we all touch on similar stuff, right? We're all kind of, there's definitely like, like Jerry talking about George, like George was there first. Yeah, He's like, yeah. we're all mining really a lot of stuff and in, in your films and the books, everything. What is the, what do you, what is the purpose of it all? Do you think, yeah. what is the purpose of us all going out? Is it merely just, are we an entertaining distraction for people or yeah. are we continuing a conversation into the future that people, artists started before us? It's, it's funny because there's so much stuff out there. So there's so much content that it's very easy to go, what is the point of doing any of this? And I can get in that headspace of mm -hmm. why do it? Does it matter? If there's 500 TV shows, why would I make one? Right. That's why I always like to go to areas where other people aren't, like the documentaries about comedians, right. or, uh, the books of interviews, because there's, there's not a ton of them. Right, right. And, um, but then every once in a while you meet somebody and they just say that what you did touched them in some way or made them happy or, yeah. um, you know, I ran into uh, this woman and she just told me this beautiful story about that she used to watch knocked up with her dad and her dad died and she watched she saw it the other day and right. made her think about her dad and yeah. you realize oh that's happening all the time yeah i just don't know it yeah i usually won't bump into that person right and that i always quote this thing that i heard somewhere the, the best gift you can give people is your story mm -hmm. and that's how you feel connected to people and i think about 
what's been important to me, like when I was a kid and I saw say anything, mm -hmm. you know, or broadcast news. Yeah. And so whenever, whenever I'm insecure, I don't know the purpose of it. I just think of how much a movie meant to me mm -hmm. and to create one that could mean something to someone else. It's like a song. Like right. what would life be like without Warren Zevon albums? <laughs> right. Like how much it's changed my life. Yeah. Just yeah. making that connection. Mm -hmm. And even if it's in a club, which I like, I like the idea that there's 200 people there and it's just gone. And it was that moment and it was really intimate yeah. and connected and then it's gone mm -hmm. and it's not judged. It's not reviewed. It's just, that is all life is. And that's the essence of life, which is it's fleeting and right. it's a collection of these right. moments. Right, right. But it's contagious. Yes. Like that that one little show, there's people walking out and carrying it and then making something or changing yes. their life or it is kind of this ongoing thing. Really great. Well, you're the best. What's that cup? I didn't even notice that cup. This is a cup I got from the Kelly Clarkson show. I filled it with <laughs> hot tea. And I didn't know that this is the kind of cup that makes the tea never cool down. So I was in the car and after like 15 <laughs> minutes thinking it cooled down, I took a big swig <laughs> and just burnt the hell out of my mouth. Uh, and that is Kelly Clarkson's revenge for us uh, <laughs> using her as a reference in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for the books. And thanks for the Carlin documentary. It really is... Uh, it really is good. People are going to love it. Thank you. Yeah, well done. All right, Aaron, we got it. All right, everybody. That was our big conversation with Judd Apatow. I hope you learned a lot of neat things. I did. Very thoughtful. Very smart. Who doesn't love Judd Apatow? Go check out the documentary on HBO Max starting on the 20th. Also, revisit the Shandling documentary and get the book Sicker in the Head. It All the money goes to charity. And um, this is Sicker in the Head Part 2. Both books uh, go for good causes. And, uh, and they're just great to have around to thumb through if you just want to read some great stuff about some of your favorite comedians. That's it. Thank you for joining us at the table. We'll see you next time. Enjoy your life.